Hi there, Joseph Kursky here, your host, to chat about geography and GIS in a technology-driven future. This is a presentation I developed for the third annual Belize GIS User Conference for a group of educators and others that were gathered there. But it can be used anywhere, really, because these messages, I think, are important for all of us in lifelong learning. I'd like to talk about why does GIS matter to education and society? Why should it matter? Por qué es importante? We could all have a talk about key issues in our 21st century world. And we could probably go all day and come up with a list that looks somewhat like this. It might include some different elements, but biodiversity, climate change, sustainable agriculture, natural hazards, population, political instability, energy, water quality and quantity, soil conservation, human health, and so on. All of these have geospatial components, and therefore they can be analyzed using GIS. My goals for this presentation are as follows. First, let's identify some core disciplines and skills. Number two, let's make the case as to how universities and students should prepare. We want to push the boundaries, even from underneath. Here I am underneath the Germany and Austria border. What is GIS, or Geographic Information Systems? It's not just a box of a bunch of tools. It's not just a science, Geographic Information Science. It is a transformational technology and method. What I mean by that is, consider the following. When motion pictures were first developed, at first they were filming what? Stage plays, right? They were filming what had already been taking place on stage. But then, aha, we can take the camera outside. We don't have to just film the same things that we were doing as stage plays. We can actually use this new technology in a new way. That's what I mean about GIS. Yes, we can look at where places are, capitals, coastlines, etc. But GIS is much more than learning where things are. GIS has to do with the interaction of things like coastal erosion and longshore sediment transport and where people live and how vulnerable they are to storm surges, for example, and much more. Maps have stirred imaginations and inspired explorations of the unknown. This has been true for centuries. Maps have always been powerful sources of information. It's no different nowadays with the advent of GIS. We all have stories about maybe how we grew up with being the sort of the map geek of the family. I was, I used to carry the atlas on my lap when we went on trips in the car. I always carried the trail atlas, the trail maps when we went hiking. As a teenager, I made maps. In fact, here's one of the maps that I made when I was a teenager. So you can see it a little bit better. Let me zoom in. So I made maps with streets, parks, railroad tracks, estuaries. I named all my streets as well. And you probably have similar stories of making maps or looking at maps or taking photos. My photos were all infrastructure, interestingly. They were buildings, parking lots, trees, landscapes, ordinary things really, but they showed my fascination with geography and with maps and cities, communities, neat places. We all have stories probably that we could share about what really spurred us on into the field of geography, geospatial, and for me it was this book, The Last Great Auk. The Great Auks were flightless birds that migrated from Iceland to off the coast of North Carolina every year. If I zoom in here, this particular uh, book takes place beginning right here, off the coast of Iceland. So the last great auk is titled that way because the great auks did go extinct in 1842. So you read this book and you know what's going to happen and you still say at the end, how could we have let this happen? Can we prevent such extinctions in the future? How can I be informed so that I can take steps to make the world a better place? Not just for birds, but for all of us. Now, using GIS is not like the old days, or even last year. It's rapidly changing. We can analyze things on mobile devices, using the cloud, using smartphones, and other technologies that up until recently did not even exist. I recommend that a university needs to model this modern GIS use, incorporating citizen science, cloud-based GIS, web mapping services, mobile apps, APIs, the open data movement, and so on. So who would have dreamed just a few years ago, like I did here in Salzburg, that I could be running ArcGIS Online, for example, with a ordinary 
Smartphone. Using GIS in society allows us to analyze current events. For example, the 2010 Hungary toxic spill that affected so many lives and so many communities downstream from where it occurred. It may no longer make the news, but those people are still dealing with it and will be for decades to come. We can analyze that and model the whys of where using GIS. GIS data or spatial data is in 2D, 3D, it's also real time. It's really quite an exciting world. An example of using GIS in education is, for example, this lesson that I created and a data set for Kent, England. What I did here was I had the students look at the historical shoreline. And right here where I'm pointing my mouse, this area that is now water, it formerly, not too long ago, in the late 19th century, was a village. And coastal erosion being what it is, it has radically altered this shore. Now I have this three-legged stool here because it illustrates also what I wanted the students to do when they trace the historical shoreline using old ordnance survey maps and old aerial photos versus modern day maps and satellite images. I had them look at the perspective, the geographic perspective, the spatial perspective if you will, content, what is coastal erosion, how is it attempted to be mitigated, what, what influence do humans have on it, and so on and also the skills. In this case, some aerial photo interpretation, some remote sensing skills, and some geographic information system skills, some skills in using maps and databases. Universities should model this three-legged stool, this core content knowledge, geographic skills, and the spatial framework, in my view. One of the ways that they can prepare is to model inquiry. Now, inquiry has to do with asking a geographic question acquiring the geographic resources necessary to answer that question, exploring the geographic data, analyzing geographic information, acting on that geographic knowledge, which oftentimes repeats itself. It oftentimes leads to other questions that lead to the inquiry process starting all over again. A couple of ways that a university can prepare. They can model these sorts of things that have to do with why should we use spatial analysis and GIS in education. Here are 10 reasons I selected. First of all, it's tied to real world issues. Real issues of our 21st century world, as I discussed a few minutes ago. It's also tied, as I'll explain further in a moment, to Bloom's taxonomy, nudging students toward the top of that pyramid where they're really synthesizing and analyzing and evaluating, not just memorizing things. It's also well tied to Last Child in the Woods and other books that talk about the importance of outdoor education. So field experiences should be deep, should be frequent, should be meaningful. It's also standards-based. For example, GIS is tied to economics, history, mathematics, science, geography, language arts, and a whole host of other disciplines. It's also inquiry-driven. GIS allows for, well, what if we changed the scale? What if we looked at a different region? What if we added a couple variables? What if we did a, a different kind of analysis? GIS allows for all those things to happen. A couple more reasons. GIS is engaging. It uses maps and imagery. People have loved maps for centuries. It allows for real investigation. It allows students to use the same tools as professionals use, thereby gaining career skills and gaining confidence in the process. It provides for good career pathways. GIS is not used just in GIS departments anymore, but it's used in human health fields. It's used in planning fields. It's used in business and engineering and so on. It's also tied to native ways of learning and knowing, a holistic view of the planet and ecoregions in individual communities, where the ecosphere is tied to the biosphere, is tied to the hydrosphere, is tied to the lithosphere, is tied to the anthro or human sphere. It's also a green technology. GIS is used to plan things like solar roofs. It's tied to wind turbines. It's tied to water quality and, qual and quantity and so on. It's also a great way to connect to the community, providing information that the community can use to improve its infrastructure and improve its aesthetics and quality of life for all of its people. Now, it's not just me saying this. It uh, also was quite evident in a new book that some colleagues and I worked on. It's called The International Perspectives on Teaching and Learning with GIS in Secondary Schools. This book has 33 countries and authors in those countries writing 33 different chapters, ranging from analyzing ecoregions in Hungary to looking at coastal erosion in England to looking at natural hazards in Taiwan. So 
this is a global phenomenon of people interested in using geospatial technologies and the perspective to have students grapple with current 21st century issues. It's really quite an exciting time. For example, in Taiwan, all the middle schools use GPS. All the high schools use GIS. Wow. Think of that. I also want to encourage you to think about GIS not just in instruction, but as this graphic shows, the education enterprise. It has to do with using GIS throughout the campus to manage campus infrastructure, to man manage campus safety, to manage the alumni network, and all those other things. Think of campuses as miniature cities. Sometimes they're not so miniature. Sometimes they're quite large. But GIS can be used in all sorts of ways on the campus, not just in instruction. Here's a tiny little secret, so tiny that you can barely see the text up here in this caving picture that I took. It has to do with something I alluded to earlier, and that is GIS is too good just for the geography department. Now, I studied geography. I came out of geography departments as a graduate student and an undergraduate student. And I love geography. Always have, always will. But GIS is too good to be confined to the geography department. It needs to be out there in engineering, in math, in history, in environmental studies, in design, in planning. And folks, I call on you to make those blaze those trails in, with your colleagues in other departments. Get the word out there, and also with the administration on campus. Again, GIS is just too important a tool. It's a transformational tool, and it's just too good to be confined to one discipline. Also, I want to make the distinction between visualization and analysis. Now, nowadays, it's very easy to pull up a map of, let's say, gas stations in Metro Denver. Where are we going to put a new gas station? Ah, let's call up a map with existing gas stations. Well, what we're talking about here is really an analysis, not just visualization. Because even for gas stations, or fuel stations, or petrol stations, whatever you want to call them, they have to do with a lot more than just where is the, the current set of, of stations, and then therefore where are the gaps. No, it has to do with commuting patterns, right turns versus left turns, uh, zoning, and so on, that have to do with uh, the, lo the location of not just gas stations, but any kind of business or any kind of thing that we want to locate on the landscape. GIS, as I mentioned before, nudges students toward the top the, toward the top of Bloom's taxonomy. Not just knowledge and comprehension, but applying their knowledge, analyzing, synthesizing, and evaluating. It also has to do with three kinds of learning, cognitive, affective, and psychomotor. So GIS really is a holistic kind of a tool that can be used. It's not just some niche computer thing, and not just some niche computer software. Also, GI GIS and geotechnologies is not just about making pretty maps. In fact, I've made some pretty ugly maps with GIS. Perhaps you have too. Rather, it's about analyzing the Earth and its people. Think of GIS and education as three ships. Scholarship, citizenship, and artisanship. Scholarship has to do with reading and writing and communicating. Artisanship, the students are gaining key skills that they can use in the workplace. And citizenship, becoming key national and global citizens. And community citizens, understanding the needs of the citizens and acting on it and making that citizenship uh, really live out. In other words, becoming a better citizen, becoming a more informed and effective citizen and making that community better for everyone. Another way of thinking about GIS is looking at classrooms, communities, and careers. GIS is good for the classroom, right? It's good for instruction. It's also good for the community. It's also good for the student's career. Not everyone, when they're teaching and learning GIS, will learn the same thing. This is a bit scary for instructors, especially if you're ha having to adhere to standardized testing. But GIS offers something for every kind of student. Some students will really get into data gathering. Others will get into analysis. Others will enjoy working with teams. Others will enjoy presenting about the results. No matter what it is, there's something for everyone using GIS. Now that being said, even though the students will use GIS and GPS and other geotechnologies because they're very engaged with it, they can tinker with it, they can modify files and make their own maps. However, the instructor's role is critical. The instructor is critical because of several reasons, but first of all, because they're the ones that frame, that frame the inquiry-based questions that the students will grapple with. Many students, in fact most students, are not used to um, thinking spatially. They're used to thinking of maps as just reference documents. You know, where is Yemen? Oh, okay, there it is. Next. 
No, rather, here, GIS and maps are used as inquiry-based tools, and the instructor really needs to be there to guide the students into thinking spatially and in these questions that they will investigate. Another thing I like about GIS in education is that it encourages students to be critical of the data. We all know that there is a monumental onslaught, right, an avalanche of geospatial and other data coming at us from all sides these days, every day. GIS and the use of spatial analysis and technologies encourage students to go beyond the tools, look at the methods used, look at the data used. What we see mainly depends on what we look for. So it encourages students to really think critically about the information that they're gathering. Where did it come from? Who created it? Why was it created? What date was it created? Was it uh, updated? Is it updated? And so on. To make sense of data and be critical of it. There is something called the Geospatial Technology Competency Model that I'd like to get into briefly here. GIS is not just dependent on geography. It has also depended on mathematics, computer science, and other things that are in this model. Also, the base of the model has nothing to do with disciplines at all. It's, are you ethical? Are you organized? Can you deal with data? Can you communicate your data and your ideas and your, your project? It has to do with a lot of different things, and that's why I think geospatial technologies are this sort of holistic and unifying synthesizing tool. GIS is great for including and incorporating field-based experiences. You can go out and gather data with probes, with ordinary smartphones, with uh, sensors of various kinds, with cameras, with video cameras and still cameras, and really incorporate those multimedia experiences and the data that you gather into your GIS-based project. There are many ways to incorporate GIS into your instruction. This little graphic talks about starting with a project that's already been created. And toward the top of the pyramid is the students are actually creating their own projects using GIS. So there are lots of different ways to use GIS, but I encourage you to start with a couple of pre-made lessons first before you go on to using GIS for something, something that hasn't been created yet. But they're all valid methods. I love this quote from Orr because it inco incorporates a lot of what we've been talking about. Now more than ever, we need people who can think broadly and who understand systems, connections, patterns, and root causes. How to think in whole systems, how to find connections, how to ask big questions, and how to separate the trivial from the important. That's David in W. Orr from The Earth in Mind on Education, Environment, and the Human Prospect from 1994. Thanks, David. This is so important, and this is one of the reasons why I think GIS is, is part of every student, should be part of every student's education, because it encourages them to think about patterns and processes and whole systems. So think of the consequences if future societies do not know how to think spatially. That's a really grim prospect indeed. Not just in education, but just think if those people are in key decision-making roles, or any kind of decision-making role. If they don't have that spatial perspective, we're all going to suffer as a consequence. So, muchas gracias, danke, thank you. Feel free to get a hold of me at any time. I have about 1,200 videos on this channel that you see here on YouTube. I also blog weekly for the edcommunity.esri.com site in my role as education manager here at ESRI. We are dedicated, my whole team is dedicated to helping you be successful in GIS and teaching and learning. So let's journey forward together and keep in touch. Thanks.